Good evening. See the uh, check-in line is uh, shortened down to just a couple people. Um, I wanted to welcome everyone uh, tonight to the Village of Essex Junction uh, annual meeting. I'm Steve Eustace, your moderator uh, for the evening. And uh, we are gonna have a little treat here in the beginning uh, to celebrate uh, the 125th anniversary from the first uh, village meeting. And uh, so we're gonna have a little uh, play reenactment of the first meeting, which won't take too long. Um, but I need to entertain a motion to recess to have that to happen. I'd like to make a motion to recess. Okay, so Tim German makes a motion to recess. We have a second. I'll second. Ann Gray, all right. All in favor of recess for the uh, short play? Aye. Opposed, nay? Nay. All right, here we go. And we all get to wear fun hats. Good evening and welcome. In honor of the Village of Essex Junction's 125th anniversary, we will go back in time to the first village meeting to elect officers and approve the legislature's passage of a bill creating the village within the town of Essex. In the early days of Essex, there were businesses on the river, but not many people living in what is now Essex Junction. But when the railroad was being constructed in the late 1840s, Painesville, as we were then called, began to grow and a post office was opened in 1844. By 1860, we were known as Essex Junction and the population grew to about 500 which was a quarter of the town's total of about 2,000. By the 1890s, many Vermont villages and cities were being created to provide more services and relieve tax burdens on those not living in the populated areas. Essex Junction was one of these new chartered municipalities. Tonight, you will meet some amazing people from that time. I'll now turn it over to Daniel Maycomer to start the meeting. Welcome everyone, by my watch, not my, not my cell phone, it is, it is 2 p.m. on Saturday after, the afternoon of March 4th, 1893. We meet to see if you will vote to first accept the act to incorporate the village of Essex Junction approved by the legislature of the state of Vermont, November 15, 1892, in accordance with the provisions of said act. Second, if said act should be accepted to elect a president of the village, four trustees, a clerk, treasurer, collector, three auditors, a chief engineer, a first assistant engineer, and a second assistant engineer as provided by said act. Third, to do any other proper and necessary business. I am one of the three persons named in the act to call this meeting to order. Our first order of business will be to elect a moderator and a clerk. Daniel Maycomer was a longtime village resident and leading citizen. His general store right next to the railroad tracks and village cemetery stood for over 100 years where the gas station is now. Daniel founded and taught Sunday school at the Congregational Church for 50 years. He lived in a large house, house which stood where the Prouty building now is on Lincoln Street. During the Civil War, he served as town selectman and was state representative in 1863 to 1864 during the heated local debates over taxes to support the war effort. He was the first village moderator taking the job at age 65. It is rumored that he was not quite as tolerant of excess debate and long meetings as is the current village and town moderator. <laughs> This gentleman on the corner here is Fred Sawyer. He was the first elected village clerk. Fred was the village undertaker and ran a crockery, crockery and dry goods store out of his house, which still stands on Main Street, right next to the old Baptist church on the corner of Grove Street. He later moved the business to the Brownell Block after 1894 and then followed his son Wilbur to California. Wilbur was the young photographer who left us so many old photos of the village around 1900. Fred is buried with his wife, Frances Axa Bates, in the village cemetery. Do I have a motion to improve, approve the act to incorporate? So moved. <laughs> J.W. Trow 
was an amazing man. An inventor, he designed and manufactured water wheels on the river and later made and marketed by mail order millstone picks for giant grinding stones. He lived at 61 Park Street. The house is still standing and is buried in, in and he is buried in the village cemetery with his family. One of his iron water wheels is preserved in a museum in Watertown, New York. Honorable Marcellus Bingham, will you read the entire 20-page act of the Vermont legislature? <laughs> Don't worry, we're not reading it tonight, but they did. Marcellus Bigham was a longtime village attorney and became village president after only one year serving as trustee. Bingham was a village loyalist and is credited with writing a witty poem rebuttal to the scathing poem, Lay of the Lost Traveler by Edward Phelps of Burlington in the 1880s, which attacked the inefficiency of the railroad and contained the famous line, and I hope in hell their souls may dwell who first invented at Six Junction. <laughs> Bingham preceded the more famous Alan Martin, longtime village attorney and town clerk. Hey, but I'm supposed to read the act. <laughs> Not now, Mr. Bingham. We'll now distribute ballots. The box will be held open for 30 minutes. Mr. Bingham, Mr. Humphrey, and Mr. Nichols will act as tellers. The result of the vote was affirmative. Of 140 votes, there were 102 yes, 38 no, to create the village of Essex Junction. The following officers were then elected. President William Fletcher. <laughs> William ran a slaughterhouse off Mansfield Ave, accessed by a dirt road which later became Pleasant Street. He was a state representative to the legislature for Essex in 1884 and 5, and after being village president for just a year, served later as first engineer or fire chief in 1897. His son Curtis also served as a trustee and state rep. Both are buried in the village cemetery. First trustee Marcellus Bingham, when Bingham became president later, the trustees often met in his office on the new Brownell block on Main Street, built in 1894 after a disastrous fire in 1893. Now can I read the Act of Incorporation? Not now, Mr. Bingham. <laughs> you know, if women had been allowed to vote and run for office, then we might have avoided some of those early problems. <laughs> the second elected trustee was Edward M. Whitcomb, who was related to both Lorenzo and Erastus Whitcomb, founders of the Great Farm, which is the last active farm in the village today. Edward also farmed and his son Edward was a World War I veteran. The Whitcombs have a long history of prominence in the village and town, of, town affairs. For those who don't know, this is my father-in-law, so I'm super excited to say this first sentence. <laughs> this crusty old Vermonter <laughs> is David J. Hunter, third elected trustee. <laughs> crusty old Vermonter. David moved to Essex from Milton to run a wallpaper manufactory by the river after the Civil War with his brother-in-law, William Shyland. They purchased the old dam, renamed it the Hunter Shyland Dam, above the current Green Mountain Power Dam. The business was very successful, but destroyed by fire just one year after David became a trustee in 1894. There were lots of fires back then. He lived at 57 Park Street in the house that recently burned down and is now rebuilt as the Habitat for Humanity House. His son, Claude, appears in a photo from around 1900 in front of the old house. We were lucky to find an actor tonight who almost has his first-hand recollections of the first village meeting. <laughs> I'm honored to be here tonight to introduce the last trustee. The fourth elected trustee may be the least known and the most interesting of all. Tory Sibley was born in Westford and as a young man enlisted in the 13th Vermont Regiment Company A. As luck would have it, his brigade saw little action until they received orders on July 1st, 1863 to march from the river camp to, in Virginia to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. They arrived on the second day of the great battle and were immediately sent to defend Cemetery Ridge. On July 3rd, Company A watched Pickett's charge 
approach in what became the decisive movement of the Civil War. Sibley's company was ordered by Vermont General George Standard and Captain John Lonergan of Burlington to flank the enemy or close the hinge of the gate, which subjected the rebels to fire from both above and the side. Tory Sibley's Tim told me somebody turned pages for me. <laughs> Company A was the tip of the spear, and he survived the almost unimaginable fury of the decisive battle. Sibley survived and lived in Boston for 23 years after the war, employed in various businesses. In 1881, he returned to Vermont, farmed in Essex Junction for two years, had a hardware business for four years, which sadly burned in the Brunel fire shortly after he became a trustee. He then farmed until 1900 and retired. He also served the village as village president in 1897. He is buried in Greenmount Cemetery in Burlington, not far from Ethan Allen. Then, after the first board of trustees was named, other offices were filled. A treasurer, tax collector, auditors, and engineers, or firemen. Is there any other business before we adjourn? I hope we'll meet soon to do something about the condition of our streets. We have a big problem, and also we need the trolley out here. The trustees met again on May 2nd and elected a superintendent of streets, Mr. Stephen Decatur Teachout, whose great-grandson and great-daughter may be here with us tonight, one of which is my neighbor, John Booth, in Maryland Vincent. He was paid 20 cents an hour for his service to fix the roads. In 1895, the village did vote to extend the electric trolley line to Essex Junction from Fort Ethan Allen in Burlington. It ran from the train station to Burlington and back for over 30 years. I certainly hope we'll do something soon to get a better water supply. What will happen in case of a major fire in the village? Would you all like to hear more about my ideas on where we can get water? <laughs> no, Mr. Bingham, not right now. <laughs> on November 5, 1893, disaster struck. A major fire destroyed three buildings on Main Street. A week later, the new trustees met to take action to provide a better supply of water for protection against fire and other purposes. On November 25th, they met again and appointed a five-person committee to find water, but it wasn't until 19 years later that the Saxon Hill Reservoir was tapped for a new village water supply. In 1894, the current Brownell block replaced the three wood frame buildings destroyed by fire. We need to do something about the hotel. It's had too many owners and I'm hearing a lot of complaints. The Folsom House, later the Central House, located across from the train station where the parking lot is now, was the other big issue in 1893. Because alcohol was served, the trustees were authorized to license the proprietors. There was significant opposition to allowing a Mrs. A.R. Fisher to operate the hotel, including a citizen petition to the trustees. They met three times on the issue and denied Mrs. Fisher a license. We don't know the details, but shortly thereafter, Walter B. Johnson bought the hotel and ran it as the Johnson House until November 1912, when this beautiful village landmark was also destroyed by fire. <laughs> You're getting it. <laughs> was Mrs. Fisher discriminated against because she was a woman, or were there legitimate reasons for these gentlemen to deny her a license? It wasn't recorded in the minutes, and we don't know. But I have my suspicions. <laughs> well, I need to get home and butcher some lambs and pigs. But don't forget the donation. We'll need to vote on that to make it official. A local group called the International Order of the King's Daughters and King's Sons disbanded in 1893 and gave their remaining assets, $130, to the new village. The gift was much appreciated. The organization was a non-denominational Christian philanthropic group, which still exists and was active in Vermont until 2009. Well, what else had happened this year before we, for our first annual meeting uh, report for next year? And I don't remember the people's names who came that year. <laughs> Sadly, just six months after being elected the village trustee, Treasurer Edgar A. Beach died on December 9th. His story is well worth telling. Edgar Beach was the first, very first to be volunteer to enlist in the Civil War from all of Essex. For this, he received $100, bounty from 
Byron Stevens, son of our founder, founding father, Abram Stevens. He answered President Lincoln's call and on May 1861 was discharged on August 15th, but Edgar re-enlisted a year later and served until the end of the war in June 1865. On October 27, 1864, Edgar was shot in the right thigh at the Battle of Boyden Plank Road in Virginia. He lay in the battlefield without cover for, of any kind, without anything to eat, and without having his wound dressed for five days. His sufferings were great, for during the first night it rained very hard. Captured by rebel forces, he was taken to the notorious Libby Prison Hospital in Richmond but he survived and was paroled in February 1865. After the war, Beach returned home and went in business, a store dealing in men's, youth, and boys' fine clothing, hats, umbrellas, and other goods, which he advertised locally. He lived on Elm Street and also served in the legislature in 1872 and 1873. Upon his death, his son Archie Beach took his position as treasurer, and sadly, Archie also died shortly thereafter. In 1895, uh, we thank you, Edgar A. Beach, for service to your village, your town, state, and country. I now declare this meeting adjourned. As village clerk Fred Sawyer adjourned the meeting, we hope you have enjoyed this look into our past and meeting some of the extraordinary folks who stepped up to serve. Since 1900, our village population has grown from 1,141 to over 10,000 people. Then, as now, as Exjunction was a great place to live, work, and play. Thank you, Ed Bonsitis, Carl Houghton, Ann Gray, Lori Houghton, Steve Eustis, George Tyler, Andrew Brown, Tim German, Evan Teach, and Dan Karen. And thanks to all of you for coming, and thank you for listening. All right, we'll uh, get everybody to uh, get their seats up in the front here. And um, can, we have a couple singers that are just gonna sing for us. They can come down while we're waiting, while we're getting settled here. And um, the first thing we're gonna do is stand and uh, recite the Pledge of the Allegiance. pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You can remain standing for the national anthem.
gentlemen all be seated. All right, I'm uh, going to start off by introducing Village President uh, George Tyler, who will introduce other members of the head table. All right. Uh, do you want me to stand up here, Steve? Sure. I just realized that my, uh, my character's part in the play was Bill the Butcher. There must have been his nickname. You know. <laughs> anyone, anyone remember that movie with five points, five corners? I thought this was kind of an irony there. Uh, so, starting over to my right, Marianne Reardon, uh, our recording uh, secretary, Lauren Morriso, and uh, I've, it's my pleasure to introduce to everybody Evan Teach, our new municipal manager, our unified manager for Essex Town and Essex Junction. And uh, Evan, Evan is going to be uh, uh, spending some time at the Nest. Uh, when is that, Evan? Uh, I'm told it's next Friday. Next Friday. And if anybody has any ideas about how things should be run around here, as, as, as opposed to how they are run, uh, if you want to go and he has to listen to you, he can't get away. If you really want to get under his skin, you're welcome. Make an appointment for him and you can go and talk to Evan. And you're going to be doing it some other times too, I think. I will try to do it throughout the year. And it is now my great pleasure to present uh, the, the Board of Trustees. You can see we've come a long way since 1893. Uh, Andrew Brown, Lori Houghton, Dan Karen and Vice President uh, Elaine Sopchak. And I'll turn it back over to Steve. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I should uh, recognize, I think we have a couple, do we have state representatives? I know we have uh, a state representative, Dylan John Batista here. Dylan? And I'm not sure who else is here. Any other state reps here? Uh, well, Lori is a state representative. <laughs> I forget, that's, that's one of the other jobs she does. Uh, and I also wanted to mention very quickly on uh, Article 4, uh, when we get to it uh, tonight, uh, we're going to have a couple of presentations, and then I'm going to do a very brief update on consolidation with the village and the town. So you, if you want to stay for that, that would be uh, very welcome. Yes. And also, we have some select board members with us tonight. I'm, I can't see. I've got my reading glasses on. We've got Max Levy, Chair of uh, Essex Town Select Board. Irene, do I see you up there? Irene Renner up there. Is that Andy? Hi, Andy. Mike. Good to see you. And Mike and oh, Mike Plagman. Wait a second. And Mike, uh, and I'm sorry, Mike. And, and, yes. and an Essex Junction resident, too. <laughs> Good day. Great to see you, Mike. Thanks. All right. Thank you, George. So uh, I'm going to start by going over the usual uh, reading of the rules of annual meeting. Robert's rules is the basic rules of order for this meeting, except for where Vermont law takes precedence. This body cannot change state law, but can change Robert's rules with two-thirds vote if desired. All motions, remarks, and discussion should be addressed to me. Please stand up, wait for the microphone, and then give your name and speak in a loud voice so that your comments may be heard by everyone. An article must be moved, seconded, and restated by me before it is under consideration and debate on an article may begin. Articles may be amended and amendments amended once. Amendments must be germane. A division of the House can be requested by the moderator or one voter before or after a voice vote. State law also allows seven people to request a paper ballot unless we've made other arrangements at the beginning of the meeting. Debate may be cut off by a motion and two-thirds vote by calling the question. The person making this motion must have the floor at the microphone, which is generously being provided right now. Reconsideration of an article is allowed by state law until we reach a point in the meeting where another article is under consideration. This means if you have voted down an article, a motion can be made to reopen consideration of this article by a person on the prevailing side. However, once I have placed another article before you, no more action be can taken regarding the article at this meeting. State law prohibits consideration of articles that have not been warned. This means you cannot take binding action during Article 4, Other Business. My role as moderator is to help you accomplish the business you intend to do. Please raise your hand and ask questions if you don't understand what is happening, if you think what is happening is wrong, or if you want to do something but don't know how to proceed technically. Please tell me if I'm ruling improperly. 
Above all, please be civil and respect your neighbor's opinions. I would like to remind people who are not registered to vote that they can't and should be in, in the back of the auditorium. All right, and if, also if there's no objection, we'll allow t uh, village employees who are not living in Essex Junction to speak at the meeting as needed to answer technical questions. All right, so here we are, ready to, ready to go with the meat of the agenda. Article one, shall the voters act upon the report of the auditor? Do I have a motion for article one? Joanne? Moved, a second. Chuck Berry is a second. It's Mary Jo, excuse me. All right, Article One has been moved and seconded. And uh, does anybody have any discussion for that? And uh, Mary Jo, you may start if you'd like, since you moved the motion. So, it's any questions? The report of the auditor is the book. Any questions by anyone on that? Okay, it's an easy one. Seeing none, I'll call for a vote on Article 1. I'm going to ask for uh, yeas and nays. All those in favor of Article 1 signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Article 1 passes unanimously. Okay, as we go on to Article 2. Shall the voters approve an annual general fund budget in the amount of $4,954,687 for fiscal year July 1, 2018 to June 30, 2019, $3,423,606 of which is to be levied in taxes against the village grand list? Do we have a motion? Chuck? Barry again? Is there a second to the motion? Mike Flagman? Okay. And uh, I believe, uh, Chuck, did you have something very quick you needed to say? The amount on the general fund here says, um, just for clarity, the, the budget is $4,954,687, and then the amount for taxes is $3,423,606. Okay. Okay. George is, uh, George is going to give a presentation on it, and I think he can address that in his presentation uh, on the budget like we usually do each year. Go ahead, George. And before I begin, I just want to also recognize one other really important person who has done yeoman work for this entire community, and that's Greg Morgan, the chair of the Essex uh, Economic uh, uh, Commission. Hey, Greg. Um, I think what I want, I'll get right into the, I think maybe what I'm understanding about this, Chuck, is that we're the, the budget is for four million nine hundred and fifty four thousand dollars but we're raising or seeking to raise three million four hundred and twenty three thousand dollars in taxes and the reason is that if you recall a couple of years ago two years ago we transferred the cost of the village public works department the street department into the town general fund budget uh, and so uh, even though it's we're kind of in a hybrid situation right now where the Village Public Works Department is still the Village Public Works Department, still our employees and our equipment and our property, but it's a shared cost now with the town. So the cost of the, uh, the recreate, the, I'm sorry, the uh, Village uh, uh, Street Department, um, which is over a million dollars, gets shifted into the town general fund, and that is a cost that's met by uh, the entire community. It's shared for the whole community. Does that clear it up? Chuck? Okay, thanks. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit more of that in a second. Um, I very quickly go through this and, and uh, uh, again, appreciate you, you coming here tonight. Um, so slide one, let's go right there. Uh, so what I see here is this, the total amount that we are proposing is 
Uh, and then we also have uh, $317,000 in debt service. Uh, and then village finances are divided into two big chunks. We have the general fund, which we, is money we raise from property taxes and we spend on municipal services like the fire department, administration, planning and zoning, library, and so forth. And then the other piece, because we own the wastewater treatment plant, uh, and it's a shared cost with two other communities, Essex Town and Williston, we, we sort of, we, we separate that out as a separate fund called the Enterprise Fund and the three components of that. Uh, but because that is money that is under, that, that's a facility and money that comes through the village, we list that as a separate fund. Uh, and money for the wastewater and sewer is paid by your water bills. Whoa, did I lose it? Uh, these are our proposed capital expenditures. Uh, we have capital funds that are ongoing funds. They're basically like bank accounts. We put money into them every year. Every year we take money out of them to pay for things, but the money going in every year isn't always the same as the money coming out. We put money in, it's kind of like socking money away for anticipated large capital expenditures. So the number one is, the top one uh, is capital reserve. Those are street projects, uh, sidewalk, uh, large, we have a bridge repair that we're doing on, on Main Street. Uh, the rest are, uh, the next one is rolling stock, uh, recreation parks, uh, sorry for the misspelling, it's not recreation, it's recreation. Uh, and uh, again, we acquired the village recreation department when the school, uh, with the school merger a year ago, and so the village recreation department is now part of our general fund budget, and so their capital costs are now our capital costs. Uh, and the other two, one, we have a wastewater treatment fund uh, capital uh, cost and a sanitation capital cost. And if I'm going too fast and I can uh, clear anything, just raise your hand real quick. So the overall budget increase, whoa, I keep losing that. Why do I, what, am I doing something? You can move your mouse off. Okay. The overall budget increase uh, operating is 135,000, and we are also uh, have $2,717 in debt. Um, the contributing factors for the increase, number one, as usual, is salaries, salary increases. Uh, this year, however, we are increasing uh, salaries for our volunteer fire department. The reason is that we are trying to um, align the salary training um, uh, internal policies of the village uh, Essex Junction Line uh, Fire Department uh, with the town fire department. Uh, we, don't, we don't have an immediate plan for consolidation of the fire departments, but because we have one administration now, uh, we are in a, a, a sort of an ongoing project to try to align some of our policies and procedures and make various departments as close uh, to each other as possible uh, when it's possible. Uh, new shared services, these are shared services that we uh, are sharing with the town. The town has created, saw the need to create two new positions, uh, one in information technology and another one uh, in employee benefits. And, uh, it, it, and so we are paying, because those people will be doing, those staff will be doing some work for the village, we are sharing some of that cost. Uh, capital contributions, we're increasing the amount. We feel that we really need to catch up more with uh, capital expenditures and street repair, sidewalk repair. So we're putting a little bit more money in uh, this year than we did previous year. And health insurance and ma matching grants. Also, we are having a, uh, put more money in for uh, another, another uh, an arts event that we held last summer and we thought it was very successful called Steam Fest. Uh, and we're gonna do it again this year. This is the tax appropriation. This gets to the amount of money that we are raising in, gen in uh, property taxes. And we see that the, the bottom line is, is that on the average village home priced at $280,000, the total impact of the property tax increases that we're proposing uh, with tonight's budget are $30.80 over last year. <coughs> These are some of the challenges uh, for the general fund. Our challenge was to maintain services while working, again, as I said, toward more shared services and alignment uh, of the fire departments. 
um, recognize additional ways to combine services with the town. Um, again, one of the big ways we have done it is to have a shared manager, which we uh, uh, did this year with the, with the town. We have shared finance director, shared clerk, uh, and sh other shared administrative costs. Uh, so we anticipate doing more of that, uh, and we'll try to keep you up to date. Uh, but so far, it seems to be working. Uh, and we are also, uh, we want, need to try to contribute more, find other ways for uh, increasing how much money we are contributing to our uh, capital budget for keeping up with infrastructure repair costs. These are some of the uh, efficiencies that we have worked on and will continue to work on, as I said, uh, combining public works. We haven't, we've combined the public works budget, so it's a shared, so we now have public works in the village and the town is shared equitably by everybody in the, in the community of Essex, in the town of Essex. Uh, and, but we, as I said, the village public works department is still part of the village. Uh, we have an MOU in force with the town and an understanding that, that, is, that is allowing that to happen. And this year, the uh, select board in the, at town meeting, some of you may have been there, they passed the, uh, the, uh, the entire general fund budget for the town, which included the village uh, public works department. Um, we have combined finance, and TGIA is our uh, initiative to potentially uh, consolidate the planning and community development offices of the village and the town into one. These are some of the big capital projects that we have in mind for this year. Uh, we have a, a Railroad Avenue water line replacement. The water, the entire street is probably going to have to be dug up to replace the water line. Uh, we're going to try to align that with some railroad station improvements that Amtrak is going to be um, performing this year. Um, we, we're doing a facilities assessment uh, in conjunction with the town to look at all of our, our public works facilities uh, and try to get some understanding of where we should go. Both the villages and the town's public works facilities are old. Um, so we want to approach per perhaps uh, renovating them in a, in a reasonable way and probably in a collaborative way. Um, West Street and West Street intersection, uh, again, that just needs some more work. And the Crescent Connector, $1,795,000, uh, but that is federal and state highway dollars. That's not money that's coming um, from the village. That's, coming, that's money that's coming from the state ultimately from the federal government going through the village and then uh, to pay for that project, and we hope that's going to go forward this year. Uh, the rolling stock budget, as you can see, we have a Vactor truck, sidewalk plow, um, two more pickup trucks, and trailer-mounted boom lift. I don't know what that is, uh, but I'm, I, we do need one. And uh, <laughs> got your attention. And uh, fire department pickup truck. You know what that is? We do. Okay. Um, I, this was, I, I, I'm getting near the end. This is, a, this is a, an important uh, slide. This is an important pie here, this, this graphic, because it shows you where most of your property taxes go, if you don't know already. Um, but it, most of your property taxes go to school. Um, and we have a consolidated school district. So hopefully that consolidation is going to slow down some of the increases that we've seen. Um, the orange slice is. Uh, the slice we still pay to the town for the town municipal uh, services, and the blue slice is the remainder of what's left for uh, is Essex Junction. And if you had looked at this a few years ago, you would have seen another slice, which was the Village Recreation Department. Um, as I said, when we consolidated school districts, we took over the rec department, so the village's slice of this pie, which was getting smaller and sl smaller, all of a sudden got bigger again. So we got to work on pushing it down. Um, but this slice also sort of represents, in my mind, uh, outstanding uh, challenge to consolidation and shared services with the town. This is something that we uh, jointly, hopefully, will be working on over the, over the next few years. And I'm got very quickly going to go over, this is a wastewater plant. Uh, see, these are some of the challenges for the wastewater plant. I won't, I won't read them all, but I think the top one we have is wastewater treatment facility is challenged by state regulations. And this is where, um, this, is, this is actually kind of serious stuff. And this is where our state representatives are, are so key. Um, we want to, we, we have a very, very high quality wastewater uh, treatment plant. We do an excellent job. We've won awards. 
Um, we have an outstanding staff, but uh, every year we are challenged to reduce in even further uh, the phosphorus, uh, phosphate burden go that we're discharging, um, tighter and tighter regulations, increase the cost of operating that plant, and that, that cost gets passed on to uh, you with your water rates. And so this is going to be an ongoing challenge. Uh, one of the long-term challenges that we're also hearing uh, is that we may be eventually getting mandates to start cleaning up uh, chloride from a road salt that slowly makes its way into the groundwater. And again, another big challenge. And I would also say that state stormwater regulations, we are ahead of the curve in Essex and Essex Junction. We have a stormwater committee. We are out in front in terms of getting grants and getting, getting our permits lined up. But again, it's going to be an ongoing challenge for this community, for the entire community in the years ahead. These just show uh, our water rates, uh, what the factors that go into, that we take into account when we determine water and sewer rates, and I won't ask you to read the entire thing. And again, these are enterprise funds. These are the capital expenditures for the wastewater treatment plant, sewer lines, and water delivery system in the village. Uh, and I think it's, I, I don't want to say self-explanatory, but this shows you how we're actually spending the money. Thank you all. All right, thank you, George. Uh, so, Chuck, you moved the uh, Article 2, so you're allowed to be the first to speak to it if you have any questions. Okay. So, uh, anybody else uh, that would like to speak, just come down to one of the two mics. And please, and please remember to state your name. Uh, my name is Abigail Taikaki. And um, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about Steamfest and the incredible event that was put on last year um, by the leaders of Steamfest. I know that this year's theme is the art of possibility, and I thought that last year's event and this year's event, I'm sure, will also remind us all what an incredible um, community that the Village of Essex Junction is and that we have a reputation of being a place for innovation and forward thinking. Um, Having to solicit sponsors and businesses, and I, I do appreciate all the philanthropic efforts of our local businesses, and I think it's important to have their buy-in, but I know that working in a volunteer to, capacity to put on these big events, um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of patience <laughs> to solicit additional donations. I know that the Steamfest organizers are hoping to get another $10,000 to put on this year's event um, and make it even uh, more magical and awesome than last year. Um, Mr. Moderator, I was hoping you could help me generate a discussion around whether we could increase um, the village's contribution to Steamfest to add another $10,000 and remove that burden of having to get additional funding from local businesses. Sure. Uh, the way we would do that is you would make a motion to amend Article 2 to raise the uh, total amounts of the budget and the amount raised by taxes by 10000 So you would have make a move, uh, move to an amendment in that. I would like to move to amend the general fund to include an additional $10,000. Okay. For so, Steve Fest. Yep. You, okay. And just to be clear, before I ask for a second, you can, your motion is for the total money, and we know that that's kind of where you want it to go, but you can't say specifically that that's what's going to Oh, I can't allocate so, but it But that's myself. okay. <laughs> Everyone always thinks that, so that's okay. fine. So do we have a second for that motion from anybody? Uh, Greg Morgan has a second. Okay. So that means we can uh, discuss that. Um, as an amendment, so the discussion is only on adding $10,000 to the budget for the idea of it being for Steam Fest. And, uh, and you get to be the first person to speak to it. And I just, I had, is there a particular line item in the budget for Steam Fest already that you can point people to? Uh, just to make it easier for I everyone. I know that it went into the matching grants in Steam Fest category originally of an additional an increase of 14. But no, I don't know what line item it is. If you can't find it, that's fine. I just sometimes it's easier if people see. It's in. Uh, it's on page fifty-seven. Page five seven. 
Economic line, development, what line item? Line 148. 148. So we can see, um, for everyone in the audience, the uh, proposed budget is 8,280 to start, so, okay. Is there anything else you'd like to say on the topic? Um, I just think that Steamfest is, uh, is just like train hop and the farmer's market, part of what makes the village of Essex Junction a really special place to be. And it's also uh, just sort of um, has an impact on um, reminding the state that we're the innovation center of Vermont. Okay, thank you. All right, um, who else would like to speak to the amendment on the floor? Go ahead, Greg. So I'll, I'll expand on that just a little. My name is Greg Morgan. I live on Grove Street. Um, and I, I chair the Economic Development Commission, but I want to be careful because my commission always says, make sure you don't speak for us. If, but, but our commission is supportive of this event. And I would go a little farther than Abby did. It, I mean, what's happening at Five Corners now is quite significant. Um, there are three centers of innovation where just a year ago there was only one. There's something called Accelerate Essex, which is a house you may have seen the sign. It's um, just next to the fire station. And that's a co-working space where people can um, uh, bring their businesses or their ideas and get fairly inexpensive space to develop those ideas and help grow enterprise in Essex. But what's spun out of Steamfest are two other spaces. One is over um, the quilt shop. Um, it was started by the hub for um, women in business in Essex. And that's a place where, as I understand it, five artists, at least five artists, but others, um, have space to do their craft. And, and th that is another co-working space. So that's two. The third one is just launched a Kickstarter and raised $6,000 um, Today, they, they finished it out, and it's called Words and Pictures, and as I understand this, it's a place where you can self-publish, and with membership, you get a membership, you pay to be in this space, it's above Martone's, and um, you can also use printing capabilities there. So what we're seeing is the emergence of this center of innovation, not just because we want to be an innovative community, but there are innovators and people building spaces and paying to be here. This is terrific. I, I, I'm blown away by what's happened. So, and, it, and a lot of it came out of Steamfest. I'm sorry to go on so long, but Steamfest sort of prompted the other two, the last two spaces to be there. And I think it's a, who knows where it's going to go, but I think it's a great investment. So right. that's my sense. Right. Thank that's you. part of our economy. All right, thank you, Greg. Anybody else like to speak uh, to the motion? Okay, got another speaker here. It's either one you can be polite. <laughs> uh, so I'm Karen Dole in Sugar Tree Lane, and um, I don't know how it, I guess I have a question regarding it. Of, i um, curious what the total budget is for Steamfest and um, what the 10000 is needed for, kind of looking at it at the, the bigger picture um, and knowing what that 10000 would be, how it be, would be contributed towards it, and um, yeah, how that would fit in, how it would make a difference. Okay. Thank you. And then hopefully that can get answered in a, in a, in a minute here. If um, I want to get all the f people to talk first, and then maybe Abby can come back after everyone's had their chance to ask their question and answer that. To go ahead. Okay, my name is Elizabeth Audet. I'm, I'm looking at this. It's line number 148, community events and programs. Is that it? Yeah. Correct. 148. The community events um, okay. was 3582. Wait, was 4,000. Budget in 18. I guess I'm trying to figure out exactly what we're asking for here. Um, 17 actual was 4,000, so the budget is 4,000, and we're asking for an additional 
ten thousand on top of the four thousand? That that. That's my question. Okay, yeah, the question, we're certainly ask, adding 10, and um, village manager can answer a couple of your questions. As I understand it, their budget with the village is 4,000, and they are asking for an additional 10 to 4, well, we could put it, but they're asking for an additional 10. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else that hasn't spoken yet want to speak to this? Okay. Um, Abby, do you happen to have the answer? to the question on what the 10,000 would be used for? Um, I don't have um, specific um, information about the budget, um, but from what I do know, what I've learned from talking to the Steamfest organizers so far is that um, um, event, essentially events such as Steamfest are not um, inexpensive to produce, and um, the, so the funding would go to things um, uh, like advertising, um, signage, but also um, there's permitting um, stages that have to be erected, um, audio and visual equipment. Um, it sort of um, provides the funding to meet the needs of the desires of what the um, the people involved in Steamfest want to to make happen. Um, there's also important things like. Um, providing like t-shirts that help people identify the volunteers involved that can give information and I'm sure there are a million other things um, that go in their budget but I don't have that detailed information right okay. now. Okay, thank you for that. Go right ahead. I'm John Wormer, I live on Sugar Tree Lane. Do you know what their existing budget is? Uh, is $10,000 a small fraction or is it going to double their budget or even more? Okay. Does anyone know the answer to that question? She's coming. She's coming. Perfect. Thank you. It's tough when it's not being run by the head of the table. <laughs> it sounds like my time of lurking quietly in the background is over. Um, <laughs> so I'm Julie Miller Johnson. I'm a village resident, and I um, I've been the managing director of Steamfest last year, and I'm doing it again this year. And I will say I was a little unprepared for um, this uh, level of attention. Um, so Steamfest uh, last year, we had a bootstrap budget of um, about nine thousand um, dollars, which was uh, which covered the cost of um, any marketing materials we had. Um, any, um, trying to think of, um, gosh, we spent that money on advertising, promotions, um, and printing. We really, like, we didn't pay for anything else. We didn't pay for our musicians. We didn't pay for um, any, our artists paid us to actually be in this event. So uh, it was a really bootstrap type shoestring thing. This year we would like to be able to actually rent a couple of tents so that our music stages can be covered in case we have inclement weather. Last year we were very lucky to have sunny skies. Um, so that would increase our budget right there by probably six thousand dollars for tents. Um, we would like to be able to have the money to pay for um, some of our musicians because it's hard to ask people to play music on a Friday night for free. Um, so that, and then a much more significant um, advertising and um, signage budget. We had, very, we had literally handmade signs for it and we would like to be able to purchase like legitimate um, signage. So we're, our budget um, is intended to take this event from sort of a shoestring operation to um, sort of the next level of a little more professional, not professional, but a little more polished, uh, artistic, creative event. All right, thank you very much. Steve, can I ask the question of Julie? Um, yeah. Well, you can make a statement to everybody. Uh, uh, Julie, before you go too, too far. If I remember correctly, wasn't there also a fairly significant amount of the budget that went to uh, being able to have the maker fair itself, like in the, the, the maker component of it? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. It's hard to be a tall. Um, so I don't know how to adjust this thing. Um, 
Yeah, last year we did give a significant portion of our budget to Maker Fair. I think well one third of the budget. All right, does anybody else uh, want to make any comments on the motion on the floor? Can, there we go. can I say one more thing? Yes, go ahead. So uh, I just want to be clear that um, my original request to the village was for $4,000. I just know that there's, if there's no line item, I don't think, in the budget. So I just want to be clear. People aren't thinking that we, I don't know. I, don't, I just want to be clear. Our original ask was for. All right, thank you. All right, is anybody else that hasn't talked yet want to say anything? It would be best if you could go to the mic. <laughs> if only we had aisle seats only. <laughs> this is a question directed, I guess, to uh, someone who can answer it, which is, um, what other events is the village putting money into, village-wide events? Okay, and also, could you state your name? Oh, I'm Andy Kolovis, and I live at 23 Pleasant Street. Thank you. Do you want to answer that, George? I can't. This is, I don't know. Andy, we put on the block party. Um, we put on, it's, some, some of these are shared uh, with the Re Village Recreation Department, but the block party is something that's completely village, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Lauren, I think we are still contributing to the, um, uh, train hop and tree lighting That's cool. um, and do we and I think we also contribute to the uh, a lot to the Memorial Day Parade um, yep. am I missing and, something? Yep. and the farmers market the which farmers is coming market. back this year and the farmers market did I leave something out guys yeah I don't uh, I don't want to overcomplicate things but is it possible to get a sense of what amounts are contributed to each of those events just to get a relative sense well, the, but the total to is line 148 right but I, I'm yeah. just curious no. No. To no. oh okay no. sorry no. okay I, I, I couldn't, I, I would love to give, the, we, it is accounted for, I can yep. guarantee you that. I can't tell you exactly what the breakdown is right from here. I don't know, Lauren, can you do that? Yeah, so uh, the block party is on line 152, and that's 7,000, but we get about 1,500 to 2,000 in contributions for that. Um, mm -hmm. The other amount that is in the... Um, Community events and programs. That is for the train hop, so it's about uh, three, uh, four thousand two hundred eighty. Um, the Memorial Day parade. I think that we don't pay much for that because we get reimbursed from the Lions Club. Town. Public Works. Public Works does a lot of the work, and then we get. Right. The Lions Club helps pay for the tents. Um, what was the other one? Uh, farmers, farmers Market, market, market we do contribute for the director, and that's about, well, um, it's 4950 in this budget. Thank you very much. I just wanted to get a sense of relative cost. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else that uh, has a question? Yeah, you may go ahead. Karen Dolan again. Um, so this has been helpful to get some more of this information and it still is confusing for me, I guess. Because um, I think, at least I can speak for myself, in support of the event, I took my kids last year and really enjoyed the event. But I think for me, the question is more of a process piece of, um, we're hearing that the original request was 4,000, now it's 10,000. Um, and it's also making me wonder, like, or for any event, can we just come and ask for this? And what does that mean? Um, so it's just a little confusing for me and um, wondering um, if there is a process that folks usually go for to submit this. And because um, it just seems like we could have five more events coming up after this being brought up. So I'd like to look at the big picture. OK, thanks. Uh, George will answer that question for you. Um, on the process. On, on the process, let me just tell you, the uh, last year what happened is Julie came to us and, and propo proposed the STEAM Fest and described it, uh, and then she came back. And I, I don't know how many times you came back, Julie, uh, but it, she, was, she was requested, she requested to have uh, her, uh, to put in a, a, a question on the village trustee's agenda. And she went to see the village manager, and the village manager put her on our agenda uh, for an upcoming meeting so that we could warn it, we could 
tell, warn people who might be interested and explain to people so the public could see what was happening. And I think she came two or th at least two or three times, and then we, we agreed on an amount. Uh, and at that point, then, she had to also work with the village manager and staff to make sure that all the insurances and permits and all that sort of thing were in line. Uh, so that, that would be the process. Um, and not that that clears it up. And, but usually these events that we're talking about uh, have some kind of a history like that. It starts with seeing the village manager. Okay. Just to answer your, your kind of follow-on question about anyone in the meeting is allowed to, you know, move the budget up, down, whatever, and if you essentially convince the whole bo enough people in the room that it's a good idea, then that, yes, it can happen, so. All right, uh, anybody else that hasn't spoken yet? Okay, go ahead, Abby. I just wanted to clarify, uh, to, to further answer your very legitimate question, Karen, that I am not asking this, making this request on behalf of Steamfest, nor did they ask me to. Um, I, they followed the proper channels and their official ask was for 4,000. I'm just, as a, as a resident of the village um, and a fan of the event, asking if we could support them with an additional $10,000 because I think it's a really cool event that could only get cooler. Um, that said, I, you know, the vote is the vote, and I love you all anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, theoretically, you're supposed to be at the microphone, if you'd like to. <laughs> well, because we don't want people calling from the back of the room. And identify yourself, please. <laughs> Bob Trudeau, I'd like to move the question. All right, we have a, a motion uh, to uh, call the question, which means uh, that we're not going to talk about it anymore. If passed, we're not going to talk about it anymore, just vote. Um, do we have a second for that motion? Second. Can't remember. What's your name again? John Wormer. John Wormer. All right, so we have a motion and a second. So voting uh, yes means we're going to stop talking. No means we're going to allow more discussion. All right, all those in favor of calling the question signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. nay. <laughs> the, the question is called. All right. So that means we are going, uh, let me just got to take my notes. So we have an amendment on the floor. The amendment is to add, to, for Article 2, to add $10,000 to both the general fund budget in the amount to raise in taxes by $10,000 each. And we're gonna vote on that, so voting yes means you're in favor of adding the 10,000, no means you want the budget as is. Any questions? All right, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Nay. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it. The amendment to Article 2 fails. Okay, so uh, that takes us back to Article 2 as written, uh, same amounts, and I know you've been waiting very patiently to talk about <laughs> something besides the amendment, so please go ahead. I'm going to adjust this real quick because there's a you may. picture and the Essex reporter will be hunched over the microphone. <laughs> We'll look forward to that I photo. I still have not lived it in. The, the other one was set up correctly. <laughs> uh, Steve Gregg, uh, Pearl Street. Um, first, I, I know the uh, trustees put a lot of time into these budgets, and I want to say thank you. But I'm up here because I have a question. Um, the reference material for this uh, inquiry is on page 31, 32, uh, 54, and 56. <laughs> so this goes back to the discussion where we bought the Park Street School building for a dollar last year mm -hmm. and uh, the question by the fellow named Steve Gregg, oh that's me, um, asked how much will it cost us to run this building? And we were told that there's some uh, rent paid by <coughs> Parks and Rec and there's a net cost of $9,000. I asked if we had that in the budget. They said, sure, we'll find it. Um, and noting that we are looking that we're going to be overspent uh, 
on the estimated expenditures for FY18 on the total budget. I would now like to refer to the Lincoln Hall slash Park Street school budget on page 56. Do you have a line item? Uh, it's the totals that I'm most concerned with. Okay. Um, so the proposed budget for FY18 has shown 50,000 874, our estimated expenditures will be 58,435. Uh, for everybody who didn't do the math, uh, 7,561 over, which is great, they controlled the cost of that $9,000. But if you really break down these expenditures that are broken out for the Park Street School that are um, on line items 116, 115, um, See, there's several of them here, 104. If you really go break it out, you can see the, the differences. And that along with the uh, additional overages of about $2,000 in line item 106, which is maintenance buildings and grounds, you come to an operating cost of 9,806, which was an excellent estimate from last year's meeting. Now, uh, we are over this year, the cost of operating a building will go up who knows, two and a half percent for next year, but we can s we still have a proposed budget for next year of 50,927. So we do a bunch of math, and uh, what it comes out to is I'm proposing, because I don't want to raise my taxes just like anybody else, but I want to have an appropriately funded budget. Um, so I'm proposing to uh, the Lincoln Hall Park School budget. No, I, I, can I propose a specific line item? Or no, you no? may not. But All you right, can so always, fund you can assert of, your interest, certainly. Of uh, $8,969. That uh, is about a 2.5% increase over this year's projected cost. Okay. Um, which is an, that's an increase to the proposed uh, general fund in order to appropriately fund um, the continued operation of this building that we bought for a dollar. So are you, well, hang on. So are you going to, could you please phrase that in the form of a motion I to amend? I move to increase the general fund uh, by $8,969 with the intent or interest of adding that funding to our operating costs of the Park Street School building. Okay, so let me repeat that. So the motion is to um, add $8,969 to the general fund budget and taxes um, with the idea that it would be moving in, in that area of, of the Lincoln Hall Park Street budget. Is there a second to that motion? Uh, Abby uh, made a second. All right. Uh, you already talked to it, certainly. Is there anyone that wants to comment on this? And uh, do you want to say anything about the, why the numbers are what they are, George? Um, I, I really can't. I, I would uh, defer to either, I don't know, if Lauren, if you can speak to it. I mean, I think. Um, I can. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we decided to put the Park Street School in with Lincoln Hall because it made sense because it was a, a building that we were supporting. Now the things that were in Lincoln Hall last year, some of them have gone down. One of them was liability insurance. Um, we're, we're anticipating less maintenance on that building in particular. Um, we don't have any capital outlay in projects for Lincoln Hall next year. And so even after we added the Park Street School into it, it, re it remained flat. Does that make sense? Uh, so you're saying that the biggest reason for the, the flat budget is that there's no capital outlay? There's, there's no capital outlay, which was 5,500. 5,237. No, Line number 117. Oh, for 5, the budget. Yep. Sorry about um, that. The liability and property insurance. Um, Line 107. Right, is going down about 1,000. Um, let's see. 
uh, maintenance buildings and grounds, we estimated that that would go down about 500. So that there were things that dropped in the Lincoln Hall budget that allowed us to put the Park Street School costs in there without an increase. At what level are we funding the Park Street School? What it needs. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, so we, we gave some rough numbers of, of where things were reductions at Lincoln Hall, and I, I was just inquiring if those numbers are, do they come out to the $9,000 that it seems it takes consistently to run Park Street School? I, I just haven't done all that detail. Sure. I, I believe the answer is we're budgeting the same amount. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Allison, you had a question? Or a question, comment? Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Allison Wormer, Lincoln Street. Um, I just want to say that a budget is a guesstimation of how the money is going to be spent. It's not, it's not a checking account with a limited amount of money in it. And then if it looks like we're going to need more, we have to borrow or something like that. And if you look at number um, 10 on the green sheet, it talks about the fund bal balance that the uh, village has. And we have... $458,000, um, which is 9.5% uh, of the budget. So anyway, we have money uh, to draw from if Park Street needs more work than is in the budget. So, Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, go ahead, Tim. Thanks. Tim German, uh, Sycamore Lane. This one strikes a nerve with me because about 20 years ago I was on the Park Street School Committee and it was the result of that effort that got us to put the money in to preserve this village treasure. It is the oldest, longest serving school in the state, uh, continually in educational use. And it really is a beautiful old building. That said, I don't support putting more money into it for the reasons that have been given. And it, I'm harking back to the last amendment too, which I also think is a great event. But I'm not a great fan of adding monies in or taking them out from what we have great trustees, they're elected, they work really hard for us. Same thing with the select board. And I think we need to respect what they've done and they have to measure all these different costs. They know the ins and outs against each other, particularly the, the um, community service type events. And we have so many different things, all of which deserve a lot of money and deserve more money than they get. But I think that's your job to do that. You do a great job at it. So. You know, I wouldn't support doing more for this, but I'm so happy that we're here talking about doing more for the Park Street School and our historic buildings. It's great. All right, thank you. Any other comments? All right, seeing none, uh, we can move to vote on the amendment. So voting yes uh, would mean, uh, the, I'll read, the amendment is to add $8,969 to the general fund budget uh, and the amount to be raised in taxes uh, with the idea that it would be spent on Lincoln Hall Park Street area if possible. So voting yes is to increase the budget, no is to leave the budget alone, just like the last amendment. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Opposed, nay. Aye. The amendment fails unanimously. <laughs> you don't often have that. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that takes us all the way back to the beginning, uh, Article 2 as written. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to say on Article 2? Uh, Richard Smith, uh, Seneca, have. So I know we really don't want to add money to our budget. We've gone over this now twice. Uh, <laughs> but this was something that actually was requested. So the fire department actually requested a budget to make sure that we aligned with the Essex Town Fire and to make sure that we matched their wages uh, for $4,799. That way we'd be able to actually align this year with them. That budget was cut $33,935, which actually brought us to the $366,864. Do you have a line item so people can look yeah, while sure. you're talking? Uh, that is going to, oh God. It's going to be the totals under the fire department, mm -hmm. be page 58. Okay, thank you. Not a problem. The concern is to align budgets, you actually have to align budgets. And so at one point, 
the town had had its budget also reduced, but those funds were actually added back in for the town fire department, so they'd be able to move forward. At that same meeting, or a couple meetings later, it was decided our budget would be lowered. It was never added back in. So the town is prepared to align budgets, and the Essex Junction Fire Department is not prepared to align currently with the Essex Town Fire Department. He knows, i talk to you. Yeah. Just Go keep going and then I'll answer. Okay. Uh, so when we look at it, we are gonna come up short, $33,935 on meeting what we needed to to actually align our budgets this year as of July 1. I propose, or I make a motion, that we add back the $3,935 to the Essex Junction Fire Department budget so we are able to align our budget with Essex Town Fire to be able to provide, as we talked about, the alignment that we've been working towards. Could you repeat, Could the, you repeat the number, please? Yep, 33935 33935 Yep. Okay, so the motion that you made was to add $33,935 to the general fund budget and the amount to be raised to taxes with the idea that it go in the fire department area to align the budgets uh, as originally proposed. Is there a second to that motion? Okay, uh, Chuck in the back. Uh, Chuck Berry. Okay, and Evan, you wanted to uh, respond so to some of that? Myself and Lauren will take this. As I understand it, the the alignment was not the budgets, it is the salaries that are taken to uh, the paid on call firefighters that they would both um, be at, I believe it's $12.50, and to uh, deal with them. One of the entities gets paid for training, the other one does not get paid for training, and so we are trying to figure out how we would deal with that. And so. Uh, there was a certain amount of money that was put in back by the town that was in fact correct to be done and we looked at it and from the village uh, standpoint no correction was needed so Pat Scheidel made a mm -hmm. motion to the, the select board to put in 13 to take $13,000 out of fund balance to pay to raise the base rate for the town firefighters to 12.50 an hour on but July 1st. On July 1st, but do none of the rest of the alignment. So the rest of the alignment, which was longevity pay, officers admin pay, nothing else was going to be done at the July 1. And then the, the thought was to completely align the departments at January 1. So that was, that was what was done. So I'll take a guess, or I'll enlighten everybody, we're the department that's not paid for training. So that's why when this goes about, that's where that $33,000 comes up. Our department does over 3,000 hours of annual training to maintain so those historical facts we heard earlier about all those buildings burning down doesn't continue <laughs> to happen in the modern century. All right, anybody else uh, like to thank you for, for the motion? Anybody would like to speak to the amendment on the floor? Okay. Go ahead and state your name. Uh, Sam Hooker, Beach Street. So to clarify, the alignment is going to happen. The uh, budget difference is a question of timing throughout the year. The 34, approximately 34,000 extra dollars has to do with the discrepancy in whether the alignment happens on July 1st or January 1st? Um, so the, the pay rates of the volunteers are planned for July 1st. We have many things to do between July 1st and a couple of years from now to align the departments. So it's not waiting, it's just the money for the salaries get done on July 1st and we have Pardon? I'm sorry, the town's salaries get adjusted on July 1st. And then there are other things within the budget that are scheduled to occur on January 1st. But a lot of the other things of alignment occur throughout the year. If that answers your question. Maybe. Uh, maybe uh, we're talking past each other. Um, and it's probably that I misunderstand. Try so, um, is it that if we don't spend this 34,000 extra dollars, alignment will happen as of January 1st next year, 
anyway, and the thirty-four thousand extra dollars would just make it happen sooner, like on July first. Is that the, is that the aim of the extra thirty-four thousand dollars, or am I misunderstanding this? One second. Sure. So, if we add the $33,000 back and bring the village up so that they're paying all of the training, like the town does, then the town won't be fully aligned because they will not have their officers' pay and their longevity pay added because those are happening in January 1. So, it would still be off kilter with the alignment. The alignment will right. we'll, we'll meet up, will intersect at January 1, 2019, if we don't add this money in today. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Anybody else that hasn't talked to the amendment yet? Okay. Let me get this straight. <laughs> Diane Clements. All right. I, I, I have a deal with the budget next, next week, so you can have fun with me next week. So I'm having fun with you now. So tell me one thing. First, the fire department at Essex Junction does not get paid if they train. Is that true? True. Essex Town, however, does get paid when they train. Is that true? That's true. Okay, so right now the Essex Junction boys and girls are not getting paid, right? Point For training. Maybe. For training. Yep. Okay, so next question. Are they getting paid the same rate? No. Okay. So the town is getting paid a lower rate. The town's getting paid a lower rate. And when junction firefighters go to a fire car, they get a two hour minimum, and the town gets a one hour minimum. So those are other differences. Okay. So those differences are you're telling me all the, all the fun and game differences are going to be on par starting January 1st. That's the administrative rates, that's the training rates, and the whole work. Okay, so what is the cost to get the paid training for the gals and the guys that save our houses when it's a little too hot? 33,000. Like burning down. Yes. The, the, the 33,000. The 33,000. Yeah. Okay. So, in other words, we can have that alignment portion happen starting January, Jan, July 1st. July 1st. Okay. Yep. And then there will be other alignment pieces that will be ratcheted between both entities starting January 1st on both sides, I'm assuming. Is this correct? Okay. So, everybody then, so if we add 33 now, our guys and gals who protect our houses from burning down um, will be on par with their Essex Town compatriots, correct? No. They'll be above. They'll, They'll be, be above. above. But the other guys catch up on January 1st. So that, so in other words, sometime at some point, somebody should have said something last month, okay, to get everybody on par. So quite frankly, I, I'd like to see them get paid I appreciate their service when they scream past my house and scream down Pearl Street as I hear them. And quite frankly, my, gr my granddaughter is thrilled to death every time they run down Sand Hill Road because she thinks it's great. So when she comes to my house, she thinks it's really great. Like, why aren't they screaming down our street? Well, I don't live in the main drag, but she does. So I appreciate that you guys in the fire department, because when I'm up at her house, I hear you guys a lot too. So I appreciate the fire department. Gung Ho, thank you very much. Let's appreciate them and, and vote yes. Thank you, Diane. Jan Abbott, Chestnut Lane. Um, I would like to go back to what Tim German said. I think these budgets have been very carefully considered. I think that our folks up front here have worked extremely hard on this. They're not trying to favor one department over the other. They're trying to get it all set by January 1st. And my recommendation is that we not try to 
redo this, their hard work in the middle, in the middle of the meeting. And by the way, I call the question. All right. So there's a motion to call the question, which we went over already. Is there a second to call a second to call that question? Paul, Paul Bellabo. All right. So uh, voting yes means we're not going to talk about it anymore. <laughs> All those in favor of calling the question, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <laughs> All right. The, the motion passes to call the question. OK. So now we're just going to vote on the amendment. The amendment is to add $33,935 to the general fund budget and the amount to be raised in taxes on Article 2 with the idea that it goes towards the fire department budget. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Nay. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it. All right, the amendment fails. We are back to Article 2 as written again. Go ahead, Diane. Diane Fuchs, Oak Street. I'd like to call Article 2. All right. We have a motion to call the question for the entire Article 2. Do we have a second for that? Second, Jan Abbott. All right, we know what we're doing now for calling questions. All those in favor of calling the question signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The question is called. All right, so this means we're voting for Article 2 as written, which I will now read to avoid any confusion. <laughs> Shall the voters approve an annual general fund budget in the amount of $4,954,687 for fiscal year July 1, 2018 to June 30, 2019, Three million four hundred twenty-three thousand six hundred and six dollars of which is to be levied in taxes against the village grand list. All those in favor of Article 2 as written signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 2 passes. All right. That takes us to Article 3. Shall the voters approve holding the 2019 annual meeting on Wednesday, April 3rd, 2019 to act upon any articles not involving voting by Australian ballot and to reconvene on Tuesday, April 9th, 2019 to vote for the village officers and transact any business involving voting by Australian ballot? Do I have a motion on Article 3? Chuck Berry, do I have a second? Mike Munson, anybody have anything to say? Seeing none, all those in favor of Article 3 as written, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. nay. <laughs> <laughs> Article 3 passes by voice. All right, that now takes us, now we're speeding right along here. Article 4, to transact any other business that may lawfully come before the meeting. And I'd like to mention, first of all, uh, that tomorrow uh, we, do, uh, we do, will have Australian ballot voting on Article 5. Not tomorrow. No. Uh, sorry. If you read it, it probably says right here. What's the exact date? Uh, the 10th. Is it the 10th? April 10th. April 10th. Tuesday, April 10th. Uh, to elect moderator, two village trustees, and um, a couple different library trustees, and a school director. So uh, please come out, if you can, uh, to, for that Australian ballot voting. Um, now, I think uh, George wanted to say a couple things yep. first yep. Uh, on Article 4, and then we'll open that up to, again, any non-binding business uh, that people would like to bring up. Um, we have three items. I think first of, first off, we're going to have Dylan. Do you want to come up and read your the resolution or Lori? Did you? Dylan's doing that one. Dylan, uh, Representative Dylan Giambattista, 
is going to read a resolution um, relating to our anniversary. So I, I should note that I'm quite hoarse and I'm quite sick, and we've been sitting here a long time, so I'm going to get right to it, and I'm not squeaking with excitement to get out of here. So, um, But, you know, one of the things that Lori and I get to do in the state legislature is acknowledge uh, significant achievements, and one of those is the 125th anniversary here of the village. Uh, so we have a rather lengthy resolution. I'm not going to read the whole thing because, again, I'm sick and I sound like I'm sick. Um, but it is notable that whereas on April 4th, 2018, the annual Essex Junction Village meeting will include a reenactment of the first, first such gathering held in 19, or I'm sorry, 1893, better get the date straight. Um, now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and the House of Representatives that the General Assembly commemorates the 125th anniversary of the Village of Essex Junction, and be it further resolved that the Secretary of State be directed to send a copy of this resolution to the Essex Junction Village Clerk. So with that, I'll hand this over to the Village President for now. Congratulations. Thank you. So I have another resolution that I am going to read because it's about neighborhoods, community, and parties, which I particularly like. So um, Steph Tallene, who's standing here with me tonight, Gabrielle Smith couldn't be with me, but they came to the trustees last year with this really incredible idea to start Neighbors Day in Vermont. So I don't know if anyone here participated. I know I did. We had... Um, a breakfast in the park and it was great and we just hung out and talked and so Dylan and I decided that um, it should be a Vermont thing and so this is our resolution and I will skip some pieces of it but um, whereas neighbors are the persons who reside in our immediate vicinity and whom we encounter on a daily basis although contact with our neighbors may be frequent we often remain unacquainted, unacquainted perhaps not even knowing their names and neighbor day is intended to develop bonds of friendship between neighbors and the goals of Neighbors Day include developing a stronger sense of belonging, mutual support, safety and security in neighborhoods, establishing connections with neighbors that can be helpful in a time of crisis, creating families of choice, and promoting opportunities for enjoyable neighborhood events. And in the late 1990s, an elderly woman died in the 17th of Paris, and her body was not discovered for months. And as a result of this tragic occurrence, in 1999, the deputy mayor of the 17th established Neighbors Day on the first Saturday in June with the hope of fostering a sense of belonging and lessening the likelihood of a similar occurrence. That first year, 10,000 neighbors in Paris participated. In 2000, the scope of Neighbors Day grew as it was celebrated in, in 30 French municipalities and has expanded across Europe and eventually to five continents. In 2017, 30 million persons across the globe participated in Neighbors Day celebrations, including groups of neighbors in Essex Junction. Neighbor Day events might include neighborhood potlucks, barbecues, picnics, pizza parties, wiffle ball, kickball. Although variations of Neighbors Day exist in the United States, no American jurisdiction has designated it as an official observance until now. Essex Junction events justifies encouraging Neighbors Day observances throughout Vermont, making our state the first to designate Neighbors Day officially. Now, therefore, be it by resolve of the Senate and House of Representatives that the General Assembly designate Saturday, June 2nd, 2018, as Neighbors Day in Vermont, and it urges Vermonters to organize Neighbor Day celebrations. And I want to personally thank Steph, who created this here in Essex Junction, and I hope all of you will find a way to participate. Steph has some information about it, so you can see her if you want to get involved. Um, and obviously, you can ask any of the trustees as well. Thank you for. Thank you, Lori. Okay. Hi, folks. I am going to very quickly try to. Yes, yes. I want to close that tab. Close that tab. Let's see. And so, I just very quickly wanted to uh, tell you where we are with consolidation. Um, I know a lot of you. Um, are interested. I hope you are. This is your community. It's not ours. It's we're kind of trying to decide what to do. Um, we think we know what all of you want to do, but we also need to hear from you. We need you to stay engaged with us and let us know what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. Um, I borrowed this from Max. Max had this, uh, and uh, Greg Duggan, uh, uh, deputy manager for the town, gave this slide. This showed this shows previous consolidation efforts. Um, 
Clearly, since we're still not consolidated, none of them, they all failed. Well, we don't need to spend much time on those. Uh, these are consolidations uh, to date, and this is not by no, no means a seamless list. As we just heard with the fire department um, discussion, uh, we are working on some of these departments are, are, are aligned. Uh, right now we're working on aligning them. It's probably going to take, like for the fire departments, uh, there are a lot of internal policies and procedures, pay scales and so forth that have to be lined up. Uh, so we're working on that. Um, and in the upper right hand corner, these are the big uh, village departments that are still independent of the town. Um, community development and planning, fire department, libraries and recreation. Um, we don't know where we're going with this. We can't say, but I can tell you that we are uh, in a, in a, having a great conversation with the town. Um, I think we're collaborating. A, a week ago, we had a, uh, a joint meeting here with the select board uh, where we talked about a path forward for aligning some, uh, continuing the align, alignment of these departments. Um, we anticipate with the new manager that we are going to continue to align policies and procedures that will help um, make his job easier. Um, ultimately, where we're going, we're not sure. But as I said, we need you to stay engaged. Please call us, write to us, email us, talk to the manager if you have ideas, uh, and stay engaged because this is your community. Thank you. All right, thank you, George. All right, so anybody can talk about any non-binding business now. Go right ahead. Uh, Laura Bierman, Jackson Street. I have a question about road construction. Last year at about this time, the for road repaving came out and included on that for early 2018 was repaving 117, which is kind of a disaster right now. Do we know if that is still planned to be repaved this spring? So, so are you, I, I think to, if you can't hear, he was asking about the part of 117 so in the village or out of the village? Out of the village. I know we do okay. Street already. That's a so. town court state project? So outside of the, he's saying, I, I know he doesn't have a microphone. I'm going to say, I'm going to say I'm not aware of 117 being on the schedule this year, so I'm going to say no, but I will bring it up to uh, Dennis who's the public works director of the town, and we will see where that is, and we'll put out, a, we'll put something out. Okay. Um, I, I can maybe clear up a little bit. So 117 is a state highway, and so the state has to pave that. We don't. Um, we could, but it would cost a lot of money, and we'd have to ask you to pay for it. Uh, so I, I know it is scheduled to be paved, and where it, when it will be paved, whether it will be this year or next year, we don't know. Um, and sometimes we don't know right up until the last minute. And I don't, is that, am I making an accurate statement there, Rick? <laughs> Gonna find the mic. <laughs> Here you take up to the podium. Yes, 117 in the village was recently done by the state. So outside this, our jurisdiction, we have no control over that. That'd be something that the state would do. Uh, we've, they should be, I know it's been on the schedule, but they had us on the schedule too. We got bumped out quite a bit. So I can't, I can't tell you, say it's gonna be done this year. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right. Yep. Thank you for asking. Go ahead, Brad. Hi, uh, Brad Luck, um, village uh, resident and also the director at Essex Junction Recreation and Parks. I just briefly wanted to take the opportunity to recognize um, one of our employees who's been with us for the last six years, Adam Solis, um, who will kill me because he's sitting right in front of me, but um, Adam is our licensed child care director who's leaving HRP in July. Uh, he's been with us for six years. Uh, he has grown Camp Maple Street. He invented Camp Reach. He enhanced Camp Star, expanded Village Kids to include a fourth site with two buses. He created the after school enrichment program. He runs the day-to-day -day operations of our busy office. <clears throat> And he's fostered a culture of continuous improvement, encouraged an entrepreneurial spirit, and set high expectations for our department and employees. He will be greatly missed, and we wish him and his family the best. Uh, and we want to just thank him for his years of service to EGRP and our community. So thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Anybody have anything else to say? I could joke that he's moving somewhere warm and, you know, you could start hating on him now. <laughs> All right, if nobody has anything, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Chuck Berry and a second. All right, motion and a second. All those in favor of adjourning signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. <laughs> the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for coming.